Hello YouTube and uh, as promised here we are sitting in the plane on a day when you normally would not want to go flying but we don't care we're going to try it out with uh, those of you uh, saw my weather briefing video from earlier on today what I've done is I've loaded in the real world weather which um, if you've seen that video you'll know is a westerly southwesterly at uh, you know uh, 30 gusting to 60 knots so it's definitely and, and it's as you can see it's raining in fact as you can see in flight simulators you have a sort of an umbrella over you in the plane which um, is a bit odd on my tail and uh, but uh, what we're going to do we're going to do a, a, a quick uh, half an hour flying around because it's just coming up to 20 past three and um, it gets dark around here at um, 348 I think and we have to be on the ground within half an hour of that otherwise it's too dark to fly so we're just gonna have a quick um, whiz around and uh, we might do a little bit of uh, track down to Dover and have a look at the port and perhaps the uh, channel tunnel train so um, let's go through our startup routine so I've done a quick walk around as you can imagine because it's absolutely soaking wet out there <laughs> fortunately you're sitting behind a big engine here so as soon as we get going we're going to warm up so we're uh, going to go to shift A a couple of times as we normally do. Turn on the master, turn on the beacon because we're about to start the engine. The brakes are on and we're going to do press A a couple of times. Just have a quick look around, make sure that nobody's going to get chopped off by our prop. And then the mags go both the start. Oh, it didn't fire. It's obviously the rain. Now, we know why that is, don't we? Because the mixture's lean. So there's no fuel getting through to the <laughs> engine. So let's try that again. That's a bit more like it. Now, as soon as the engine's on we'll turn the alternator on because we don't want the battery to discharge and uh, we're going to turn on the uh, navigation lights and so that we don't run anyone over on the taxi lights and the master switch energizes the instruments so we call manston uh, golf bravo alpha foxtrot mike two on board uh, ready for taxi to the active for a southerly, southerly departure and I think we'll get clearance to runway 28 and we'll probably go to holding point Bravo so all right. now did I not say to him to be careful of my tail let's have another go right I'm back in the plane I'm just uh, going to i going to start the plane up really quickly because I'll need to move it forwards to uh, make sure that we don't get the tail taken off again. So here we go. It's amazing when um, you need to do things quickly, how quickly you can do them. Brakes off and move forward a bit. It looks like the rain stopped. That's the new um, passenger terminal on the plane. They do a lot of uh, servicing of cargo planes here. Now we do get some lights on. Now 
can see on the top right hand side there, I've got it on the cockpit view, it's just gone off now, and I've got the zoom set to 0.5, and I find that um, 0.5 is about right. It's a good compromise between um, usability and uh, what you'd, you'd be able to see in the normal cockpit. We're going left on Charlie here. Those clouds, they don't look good to me. I don't know with the, the wind and the high tides that they forecast today whether they're actually going to be sailing from Dover. It's quite possible that they'll um, stop the they'll stop the ferries. I'm just stop on the taxiway here because we're in no end of trouble with this setting this simulation up do the world time because I said 318 really we need to depart and it's already put it on 418 so that's 318 and we've got everything else right so let's do this properly 318 348 sunset 418 is when we need to be on the ground That's a bit more like it. It's a bit dark, wasn't it, to start a flight. Now we're going to use our um, favourite... Oh, did you see the wind? Take the tail there. The wind is coming from the right-hand side from the west and so of course it's going to blow the tail from our right to our left which is going to blow the nose from our left to our right so the sooner we get into wind I assume we've got takeoff clearance as soon as we get into wind uh, the happier I'll be now on a flight with high winds one thing you are going to know is that if it's a round trip you're going to go much faster one way than you are the other so let's just line up. And I'll do one other thing which actually uh, puzzled me a lot when I started um, flight simming, and that is how to get rid of the menu bar across the top. Because there's no. And what you do is you press and hold the Alt key, and it just vanishes. Um, I uh, use full screen. Alt Enter puts the sim into full screen and takes it out of full screen. We just give it 10 degrees of flat. There we go. So I haven't done any run ups. We could just do very quickly do run ups here. I'm holding the brakes, checking the mixture switch, looking at all the temperatures and pressures, uh, everything seems to be fine. And then we'll check the ignition, so right, both, left, right, and left, both, so everything's fine. And then lastly, right back, see if we get a stall. We haven't got a stall, so that's fine. So we're all Everybody's um, strapped in, so off we go. Now with the wind coming from the west, we're taking off to the west, we're taking off into the wind, so what we have to do is subtract the speed of the wind from the speed at which we're flying. Oh, yeah, let's take off into a shower. Uh, staying over to the right hand side of the runway, as I said, then. Uh, Climbing out at the top of the white band. So Manston's 200 feet, as I say, above ground, uh, above sea level. Assuming that the barometer is correctly set. In fact, I've just corrected the barometer because it um, wasn't correctly set. So I pressed B to set the barometer. Now we're 300 feet above the ground, so we can start to feed up the flaps. Now the flaps are up. You can see the wind's gusting, can't you? Because our wind, our airspeed's going, going all over the place. And I'm going to turn left, and we're going to climb to 2,000 feet and uh, pop down to Dover. And because the wind's off the nose, the wind is, is going to catch the nose as it comes round and turn us around quite quickly. Look at that! Got a massive great gust. Took us up a few hundred feet there. Now, 
the temptation is, like in like a car, is to sort of accelerate off. But in fact, when you're um, climbing in a plane, you want to climb to your assigned altitude, and you generally do that quite slowly. In fact, what what you do is you make up for that at the other end, because obviously, when you're flying along at 5,000 feet and you're arriving, you can descend, and you can descend very quickly. You can come down at um, top of your green arc, so something like um, 100, 130 knots perhaps even 140 if the air is, is pretty still. You wouldn't want to get too close to your top speed on a day like today because the gust would, would quite easily put you over the top. So, so there we are at 2,000 feet. So remember this attitude power trim. So we'll put the aircraft in the correct attitude, which is level it off so it's neither climbing nor descending. And you do that by looking at this meter here. then it accelerates to its flying speed and because you've still got climb power on it tends to start to get a bit too fast so what you do is you then cut back the revs to your cruise revs which um, on this trip I'm going to choose about um, 2350 rpm and you can see that on the rpm meter down here I've set 23.50. Anything from about 21 to 26 and a half is okay, but um, for fuel efficiency, fuel economy, and uh, just to reduce the wear and tear on the engine, anything from 21.50 to 23.50 is quite reasonable. The opposite to attitude power trim is power attitude trim. In a descent, what you'll do is you'll in a descent, as you, uh, you want to level off, basically you level off because you're, you're going down at a decent speed, so you level off. But as you level off, of course, your uh, speed slows down, so you have to add power. So it's attitude power, and then always lastly trim, trim everything off. You see, I've finally managed to get all the um, scenery working. This is just flight, I think. So the horizon, I think it might be the horizon scenery. Let me have a quick look. It's the horizon VFR photographic scenery, Generation X, version 2. So it's an old one, but it's still, you know, it's very good. And I did say I was going to be flying flights in unmodded, and in fact, that is true. I'm, I'm not going to ask you to some deal down there. That's the uh, golf course where they play the open. Um, I'm not going to ask you to buy a, a load of expensive planes or mods, really, because I've been flight simming for a long time and the enjoyment really comes out of the, the activity. I mean, I'm not saying don't buy planes. If you, if you fancy flying a particular plane, then do. I've got a few. I've certainly got the, the PMDG um, planes I like. Uh, I've got the um, 737. I bought their original version of the 747. I think that when they bring that out again, I should probably buy that. There's a tremendous amount of investment in time to get those to fly. They're, they're a joy to fly, but um, a tremendous investment in time required. You can see I, I'm sort of getting pushed over to the left-hand side here by the wind. Um, I'm having to turn to the right, really, just to sort of go forward and to the left. So, but well, that's fine, you know, in a strong crosswind, really, that, that's exactly what you should do. You should turn the plane so that uh, it goes in the direction that you want. So, there's the port of Dover, off the uh, left-hand wing, or the port wing. Port wing. <laughs> so let's go over and uh, see if there's uh, any activity going on there. Now, um, funnily enough, although strong winds are a hazard when taking off and landing, they're not that much of a bother when you're flying, because 
an aircraft moves with the wind. So really it's, uh, since speed over the ground is affected by the speed of the wind, the aircraft's speed through the air is completely unaffected. It doesn't matter how fast the wind is going, you're still going to be going the same speed relative to the air. So there you can see my um, airspeed showing at around 110 knots. And in fact, uh, I'll be going 110 knots through the wind, whether the wind is stationary or, or, or blowing at 110 knots itself. It's how fast I'm going over the ground that will... Um, it's the sum of your speed through the air plus your speed, the, the sum of the, the, the wind's speed over the ground that ends up being your speed over the ground. What we don't like, of course, is some um, turbulence. Certainly passengers don't like it, and also we don't like fog. Because fog makes it extremely difficult to land. And in fact, I personally would never fly when I was expecting fog. And, you know, certainly you, you could get caught out if you were on a reasonably long trip and um, you're coming home and all of a sudden fog sits in. Because it sets in everywhere, not just where you're going to land, it sets in, in a 50 mile radius around where you're going to land. So. That makes it very difficult for you. Best thing if you see fog starting from just land anywhere, it doesn't matter. So, what have we got? Well there we are, here's the port of Dover. Doesn't seem to be much in that um, Dover Castle on the hill there. Doesn't look much in 2D, but it's, uh, it's worth a visit. Certainly on a rainy day like today. There are no. Um, oh, you can see the ramp there, where the ferries pull in, pull in, but no, no ferries. So I was right. They cancelled them all. Cancelled them all. And left them in France by the look of it. So let's uh, fly along the coast for a bit, and we'll see if we can find the um, Channel Tunnel Railway. That peninsula you can see uh, on the horizon there is um, Lid. Lid has an airfield. And as far as navigating as you're flying around, obviously you cover so much ground when you're flying. Um, you do, um, let me just, um, I'm going to do, that was a turning point, I'm just going to do what they call a Frieda check. So we don't need the landing lights on. And a Frieda check is, it stands for fuel, F is for the fuel, so we'll have a look at the fuel. In fact, we've, we've got about a third of a tank, so for our short flight that's, that's going to be okay. And then the R in Frieda stands for the radio. I'm not using the radio at the moment, so, but you would check that you were um, in communications on, on the correct frequency. E stands for engine, and the engine basically is the uh, oil temperatures and pressures. So it's all these dials here. So oil temperatures in the green arc, oil pressures in the green arc, the vacuum, which is um, the suction that works a lot of the uh, dials that work by spinning around. They're sort of spun up by a vacuum, so that's fine. The um, electrical system, the amp, amps, in other words, the output from the alternator, again, that's in the green arc. The uh, exhaust gas temperature, is a measure of the efficiency of the engine. It's the literally the temperature of the exhaust gas. And the um, way that you adjust that is to adjust the mixture. So you can pull the mixture out, go all the way out, but just a bit out. You need to pull it out until you hear the engine slow down and then push it back. Because you don't want to run it too slow. And we'll go into that perhaps when we start to fly a bit higher. And basically what it does is it um, reduces the amount of fuel going into the engine to match the reduction in the oxygen as you climb and the fuel flow which is is pretty good certainly within limits so um, the D in the Frieda check is the direction indicator or the DI which is this thing and it needs to be periodically reset to the compass because it works off a gyroscope and the gyroscope is not 100% accurate especially in steep turns and things so occasionally you need to realign it and you do that by pressing D so we've done that and the A stands for the altimeter 
and that uh, has a setting here which is determined by the local, the regional pressure setting and the way that you, uh, the way you reset that is to press B for barometer, barometric pressure. So this is Folkestone, this is not Deal, Deal, Deal is this peninsula out here. Well, perhaps we'll go to Deal, Deal's not today, Deal's got a quite a nice um, Radio Navade on it, a VHF omnidirectional rangefinder, which we'll talk a bit about when we come to the section on advanced navigation. But I'm talking of advanced things, I'm going to turn north now and um, because in front of us you can see the railway station, which is the Channel Tunnel railway station. Now don't get this don't get this mixed up with Eurostar because Eurostar is the one that you catch in Waterloo or Ashford. And goes through the channel, uh, and goes um, through the channel tunnel, and is a passenger service. It's literally a train. This is um, a service for getting lorries and cars through the tunnel, Euro tunnel. And what happens is you drive your car, or more likely your lorry, down here, and you go onto one of the um, platforms, and then and then you drive. You literally drive into the side of the train. It's quite exciting. First time you do it. It's very quick. We can see the we can see the mouth of the tunnel there, where all the trains go in, and that uh, marshalling yard on the left is where all the cars are put on onto the trains. Cars and lorries. So. The scenery was, I think, uh, dates dates back to a time when it's only just been completed. Probably to fly over it now, it probably look a little bit more uh, more finished. There's the tunnel now. two looping access roads that you go up and over and then down to the platform depending on what train you're getting on. Right, South Kent Coast, North Kent Coast. As I say, as far as navigation goes, I mean you tend to get a feeling, you might, you might sound uh, silly to say that you, you tend to pick up a large area obviously around where you fly, you know it very well. So for example when I take off I know where Canterbury is, uh, I know where Dover is, I know where Folkestone is, I know where uh, Deal is along the coast if I want to do a little bit of local flying. Um, if I'm flying to London, or we're flying to Fa uh, over Faversham, if I'm going north-west across the Thames estuary, I know to head for Canvey Island. If I'm going, if I fancy a day out the seaside, I go north and go to Clacton. That's a nice little um, airfield, perhaps we'll go there when the weather's a bit nicer. And then uh, the other, the, the reasonably long trips, obviously if you go east you can go across the channel to France, but we'll do, we'll do a cross channel trip once, uh, one day, and um, that's good because you can claim the tax back on your fuel, so all uh, fuel which is, um, crosses a national border is free of tax, so if you've got a full tank, um, you can claim the tax back on the fuel that's in the plane, even if you didn't use all of the fuel on the trip. So um, you can almost pay for your flying doing that. Uh, all you need to do is uh, fly across to France, claim claim the uh, entire cost of the tax on the fuel, and then um, just top it up when you get back, and then the next day fly across again, claim the cost of the tax on the entire tank, etc., etc. It's not quite as easy as that. And of course they are going to cotton on to the fact that um, your flying is not sufficient to empty the tank every time. So <laughs> They're probably going to disallow your claims. But it's nice to think that you might be able to do that. Well, you can see, you may be able to see right in front of us, there is Canterbury Cathedral. And I'm going to head for that. So we're going to leave the Lid Peninsula for another day. This on the right hand side is the, um, is the Lee Valley. Is it the Lee Valley? I don't know, it might not be. 
anyway, it goes up to Barham, and um, there's a very, very small airstrip at Barham, which is a bit hairy to land at. How are we doing for time? Well, we took off at uh, 1518, didn't we? So we've been flying for about 18 minutes, so we're not doing too badly. We'll do um, Canterbury and then um, Whitstable, which I promised to take you to yesterday, which we never got to. Oh, the weather's closed in. Let's just descend to 2,000 feet and check that time. It's not uh, just the fact that we've climbed into some cloud there. No. Looks like it's pretty claggy, doesn't it? Oh well, okay. And I was going to show you Clipgate Airfield there, but I'm afraid I can't unless some, something miraculous happens. I'm going to carry on on this heading, sort of 330 at 2,000 feet and uh, towards Canterbury. Just because we can't see where we're going doesn't mean it's not the right direction, does it? Now you might say, well look, uh, you know, look here, FS Derek, you're flying along in a plane that's got an autopilot here. <laughs> why, don't you, why don't you just put the autopilot on? And the answer is that, it, again, it's not typical in the same way as people don't train to fly in 747s. People don't normally get autopilots <laughs> in their aircraft. <laughs> Certainly not in the early days of their flying. So um, you have to learn to fly manually, you know, properly. What do you say, properly? And uh, so flying along at 2,000 feet in, in some pretty atrocious conditions is, is necessary. And finding your way back to the runway is, is uh, if you're ever going to land, is necessary. So I'm not going to make extensive use of the autopilot, although we could do if we wanted to. And you know, you do, if you, if you feel that you need to, then, then do, by all means. Now, remember what I was saying about coastlines, really, um, at the moment, we may not be able to see much, but I know I'm over land. Um, if all of a sudden I was over water, then I would know that I'd gone too far and I'd gone over the coast, over the North Kent coast. So I would know under those circumstances, because we're flying around in a big right-hand circle, I would know that I needed to turn right. There are rules about uh, visibility when you're flying, you have to be able to see so far ahead. And actually they're pretty, um, they're not too onerous, I think, I think it's, uh, you know, it's not like you have to see 10 miles or anything. Just far enough to avoid a collision is, is, is enough. In conditions like this, if the um, temperature was lower, we would be worried about freezing. So we would have things like the pito heat on. Pito, if you can see it in here, no, you can't. See the sun going down. But the pito um, is the measures the f air pressure coming up the plane from the front, and um, is responsible for telling us our speed. Uh, should it start to ice up, then uh, our airspeed indicator would start to misread. And um, typically it will start to tell us that we were flying slower than we actually were. Now, I don't know whether you can see that. I can just see Canterbury Cathedral off the um, nose of the plane there, so it's always reassuring when you're expecting to see a landmark and it actually comes up. It's a shame we can't see it properly because it um, would have been nice to I could have shown you the cricket ground and uh, the scenery we had quite a quite a bit of trouble with uh, last time we flew didn't we? In fact that's all fixed now and um, what I've done is I've um, I reinstalled, I installed all of the scenery packs and there are four for each region. There are, there are, I've got three regions and each region has three sub-regions uh, so that was nine in total and each one of them had four uh, 
files that needed to be installed so in the end I just installed them all and then you have to make some changes to your settings to make sure that they all show up properly um, it's useful to have the original manual when you're doing this but the, the scenery settings for the particular scenery I've got the VFR scenery is um, level of detail radius large and then the mesh complexity 100 and mesh, resu mesh resolution 5 meters and texture resolution either 1 meter or 2 meter depending on whether you want to use the 1.2 meter or the 2.4 meter scenery respectively so 1 meter or 2 meter the water effects high high one times it says and land detail textures off that contrasts with their website which says land detail textures on but in the actual manual that came with the scenery it says land detail textures on and there's Canterbury well, I suppose many people are outside there they're all probably indoors thinking who's that idiot flying over the head and playing a plane so Canterbury we're going to turn and we're going to go northeast because we're on, we're on our way home now there's not much to see now so the idea was really just to fly in some atrocious weather. Um, we've got sunset in five minutes. And that's about right. There it is, it's going down there. Once that goes down, it's going to start to get dark very fast, isn't it? You can see the... Um, see the sun's behind us. And you can also see that when that light goes, we're going to be in severe trouble. <laughs> Just a note on uh, water effects. I'm not a big fan of water effects. I don't think the in the FSX they ever really got that perfect. It's a bit hard to blame. It's 10 years old this program. Probably more. But um, really they, they never look right. I'm talking as someone who's obviously flown over water and really it's, you can almost never see any effects in water. You never you never really think, oh, look at all the waves or anything. Sometimes reflections are nice, but um, the effects, no. The effects are what you see on a beach. When you're sitting on a beach, you can see water effects. Flying along, the water's pretty featureless. And you really don't want to be concentrating too much on what the water's doing anyway. It's totally irrelevant. Unless you're, you're literally going to land in it, and then you, you want to see which way the waves are breaking, so that you can uh, either land with or, or cross the waves. So I turn wave effects off, water effects off. Now if you look down there, that's Maypole airfield. You see the airfield down here? You can just see it down here. That's another nice airfield. And knowing the local geography like that is, um, is useful because obviously now I know exactly where I am. You wouldn't be able to say exactly where I was looking out the front there, would you? But uh, this is one of the advantages of knowing the area. A, of having the VFR scenery, and secondly, of um, knowing the local area. There we are, look. Oh, look, I've just flew through that shower. So there's uh, Maypole Airfield. It's a nice grass strip. It's about 500 metres long, and always useful in the case of an emergency. So on the left there, we've got Whitstable. This is Whitstable. This is um, Sheerness, the island of Sheerness. If you're flying uh, north or west, then you tend to fly Sheerness. London, London is this way. Whitstable sort of tapers out and turns into Home Bay. And here's Home Bay. You have to be a bit careful because um, if planes are taking off from Manston, they're going to be coming this way. So I want to stay south of Manston. Sure enough, there's um, Manston Airfield, so. And then on the um, on the peninsula here, we've got uh, Margate and Ramsgate. So I said we're going to uh, make up a little bit of uh, time here, so 
I'm just going to pop it in a descent. We don't, don't want to go too mad in the descent. Uh, I'm going down about seven and a half, um, 750 feet a minute. Which is fine. And we call up Mass at this point um, and say something like Manson, Golf Bravo, Alpha Foxtrot Mike um, to land. And we want to go down to about 1200 feet. So all that uh, time we lost in the climb out, we're now making up because we're, we're steaming along at uh, 120, 130 knots, which is 140, 150 miles an hour in the descent. Now we're descending, so we want to rich the air, so we want to push the mixture right in. You can hear the engine note just climb there slightly. And now we're at, uh, we're at roughly a circuit mark, so. 1200 feet, I think, circuit mark. There's something in the air up here, I'm just going to keep an eye on that, and something here as well, possibly. So. Now there are all sorts of checks and they've all got initialisms and the landing check is bumfitch. Don't ask me why. You need to work you need to um, check that the brakes are off. It is possible to land with the brakes on. Doesn't usually make for a very good landing. Skidding and loss of control <laughs> is usually the result. Now we're descending on blind faith there, so I can't see a blind thing. So, I'm still going to take it down to about a thousand feet, and without losing control, cutting back on the speed a bit. U stands for undercarriage. Now on this plane, we've got a fixed undercarriage, so uh, we're not that bothered. M stands for mixture. And as you just saw, well, the mixture is rich, so we're okay there. I'm going to turn now on to uh, towards the um, towards the direction that we want, which is 280. The turbulence there, and uh, I'm going to keep it in a sort of a 500 foot, 750 foot a minute uh, descent. Now I know that when I see the Port of Ramsgate, I can afford to straighten up a bit because. So, we don't want to be much lower than 700 feet, bearing in mind that the uh, ground is 200 feet, so we're only 500 feet above ground level, and that's about as low as you can get in a light aircraft, believe me. So we're in the white band now, I'm going to drop the first stage flat, and carry on turning gently. In the textbooks they show this, these are all as right angle turns, but in fact they, um, you know, you can't turn a right angle in a plane. Yeah, the airspeed's jumping about all over the place there. The other thing I always turn off, as I say, is some um, shadows. They're like casting shadow on the ground. And this probably doesn't mean anything, but... Um, really, um, you, you won't miss not seeing a shadow on the ground. So, we're going to tell air traffic control that we're on uh, finals, so we're finals to land 2-8 Golf Foxtrot Night. And he'll give us clearance to land, so he'll say something like clear to land, Golf Foxtrot Night clear to land, 2-8. And he'll give us the wind, which is about 2, I would say, well it's coming slightly from the right, so it's about 300 degrees at about um, 30 knots. We're going really slowly, but then we don't mind that because this is why you land into wind. 
in fact uh, we're going along at 80 knots and in fact if the wind was at 80 knots as well I'd love that because you'd be able to float down like a sycamore leaf wouldn't you? so this is great landing into a strong wind is fine it's the as I say it's the turbulence you don't really like now in a light aircraft you come down at a steep angle so you don't take any notice of these lights and the reason for that is because at any time you could have an engine failure it's not like a jet that's got four engines it doesn't really matter if one fails or even two if my engine fails I'm in big trouble if my engine fails I want to land on the runway and so I come in very very steep like this and I can afford to have an engine failure now and I would still land on the runway so let's just simulate an engine failure now there's my engine it's idle Actually, I might be beaten by the wind because the wind is you know, much more of a headwind than I thought. We're almost hanging in the air, aren't we? I'm going to have to give it a little bit more. I don't want to end up too low. And the other thing is that um, if we land right at the beginning of the runway, it's going to take us half an hour to taxi down to the exit point. So it does require a little bit of skill. I'm just going to drop some more flaps. But um, really what we want to do is we want to land somewhere near to Holding Point Charlie, which is the one we can just see over the top of the dashboard there. And by doing that, we can considerably reduce our taxiing time. There's two ways you can do it. You can either land and then sort of whiz along the runway brake and turn off, or you can, but why don't you sort of not too cheeky about it. You can sort of fly down the runway but it is a bit cheeky because you're not allowed to fly a taxi. Just gonna drop the last one flaps out. Coming down very slowly. turning so I suppose we'd better come down down we come look that we were nearly stationary when we landed there did you see that flaps up and off we go watching out of course for the, the um, weather vane effect it's going to try and turn us around to the left because the wind's going to be pushing on the tail to the right. There we are. So that was now when when you go flying, you know, you're probably not going to want to go flying in weather like this. Um, you can actually imagine most flights are made in, uh, well, you know, if there's a cloud in the sky, most pilots won't go up. Not just, uh, I mean, this is in the real world. You know, a lot of private pilots won't go up if there's, any, if there's a cloud in the sky. But, um, you know, why not? Why not? It's all about safety. If you feel that you're safe doing it, then, then why not do it? Um, don't worry too much if... Um, well, I mean, if everybody does think you're mad, then I would perhaps reassess what you're doing. <laughs> but, uh, and, and certainly today is not a day I would go recreational flying. But anyway, all the uh, virtual scenery is fixed. Because you're worried about skidding um, and these planes do skid and uh, they do in fact they skid very easily because you've got the, the powerful engine you've got the um, momentum of the plane and, and three tiny wheels the thing you do have to worry about is of course tipping the plane up and that's a problem because the first thing will happen if you do tip the plane over is that the propeller will strike the ground and as soon as the propeller strikes the ground that will stop the engine dead instantly stop it just stop it instantly and a, a very large engine like uh, of this type that's that goes from moving to stop in no time at all is going to suffer a lot of damage and so really you're, you're not only going to um, knacker the plane oh, so we don't get blown away by his um, jet wash you're not only going to knacker the plane, you're going to knacker the engine, the whole thing, so the whole thing is practically going to be written off, and that's just because uh, it just um, tipped over. 
So, you would normally check the magnetos um, to make sure that you're leaving the plane in, in a good state. In fact, I've ended up turning them off there, so that's a bit, that's a bit naughty. So I'm going to pull the, pull the mixture out and um, turn everything off and uh, pretend that didn't happen and let whoever flies the plane next sort that out. Anyway, there we are. So it doesn't look like it's going to stop, so we're going to get soaked on the way into the terminal. But um, next time we meet, perhaps we'll do it under slightly nicer circumstances.